Uh, very good morning to you, brothers and sisters in the Dharma. Uh, thanks for coming so early in the morning, especially on a Sunday. Uh, but I think uh, as far as we Buddhists are concerned, making great effort to listen to the Dharma at the right time is always a meritorious deed and uh, I think you are practicing it today. Uh, now the topic that I have chosen is called uh, Why Bother to be Morally Strong? I think this is a very important topic to talk about. Uh, we are living in a very fast-moving digital age. Everything has to be fast, everything has to be responded very quickly. Uh, people have very little patience for many things, uh, not just in the corporate world, but also in daily living. And as a result of all this industrial 4.0 and whatever you call that, uh, more and more people are looking forward to certain things but putting behind certain other things. And one of the things that a lot of us have basically put behind uh, is the value systems that we have. Uh, we see as the society progress, our value system deteriorate from day to day. Uh, what we used to believe as important during our time now don't seem to be important for the younger generation. Uh, what used to be our practice in the past, the different generation today don't see as something that they would like to continue as traditions. So we're in a very challenging time while we want to embrace change and progress. But at the same time, we are also faced with what should we hold back and what should we hold on to as something that we should be our principles and things like that. And one important thing is, it's about morality. It's about our moral foundation. And this is a topic continuously being challenged to us. I mean, if you are a Buddhist, when you go out to work, when you face with certain clients, you know, colleagues and friends, they always, from time to time, will put you in a spot about issues that confront our moral values. And to a certain extent, some of us say, wow, how to do that? You know, you talk about five precepts. It's very difficult to be done. When I, it's, it's only good when you come to BGF. The moment you leave BGF, it's not applicable anymore. So there's always these issues that is confronting a lot of us. And it goes back to the very basic things that we all believe in. It's about the law of karma. And uh, there are different interpretations of law of karma. Uh, to, I mean, if you look at the sutta, the sutta says that different people who look at law of karma in a very fragmented manner. There are people who believe in the law of karma because they say, as long as there is a being up there, I believe. So, to a certain extent, people who believe in God do believe in the law of karma, but not fully as what explained by the Buddha. To them, I do not do anything bad because... I do not want to be punished at the end of the day. I do something good because I want to be rewarded with something at the heaven at some point in time. And the motivation behind them, why they do good or why they do bad, is because there's a divine being somewhere. And that's their belief. The moment that divine being is no more there, or somebody can prove he's no more there, or they don't believe he's there, the entire sets of morality that they believe in crumble because it doesn't hold water anymore. Now, there's another group of people who believe that actually in this life, what karma are you talking about? You know, the Chinese say, Jing zhao you jiu, Jing zhao zui. You know, Let's enjoy our life. Life is only one. Uh, young people like to say, YOLO. <laughs> you only live once. Uh, so why bother about all these things? You know? So there could be uh, something like that that would affect uh, people's thinking. And when people look at life is only one, there will be a group of people who will say, why want to do good? Look at them. They are not good also. They cheat a lot of people. They stay in nice big bungalows. I am so good. I practice a precept every day. Look where I am. You know? I try to be truthful in my office. I always get sidelined. Yeah? The stupid guy down there make all the story, he's not promoted. Now, there are people who look at life that way. 
and they start to not to believe in the law of karma. And this is an era, a, you know, a century of moral dilemma with a lot of people. And uh, to a certain extent, some people say this word, why bother to be morally strong? I don't have to. Anyway, you only live once, right? YOLO. So forget about the whole thing. Just do what you think is right to do. Just do what you enjoy doing and let it be. Now, do we subscribe to that as Buddhists? Now, this is a very interesting topic to talk about. Now, it has a lot to do with the law of karma. It has a lot to do with our existence. It has a lot to do with our perspective of life, how we look at life. All right? So, are you with me so far? Yes, okay. Yeah. Ah, it's not working. Just a minute now. Now I know why it's not working. Okay. Now let's look at life. Life, oh life. That's a song. Life, oh life, oh life. Remember the song? <laughs> there are all sorts of people in this life. And uh, when we look at human existence, it's very unique and it's very different. Uh, even siblings born in the same family, they don't share the same life. At some point in time, you find that their lives are apart. Yeah? Some siblings are more successful than the others. Some siblings basically go down and down and down. Some siblings go up and up and up. And uh, that's what life is. So when we look at some are lucky, some are not. Uh, in hard times like this, some people still survive very well, some don't, you know. And uh, some are wealthy, some are not. Some are intelligent, some are not. Some are healthy, some are not. Some people, no matter how hard they try to take good care of their body, always fall sick one. Some people never take good care. On the wee hours of the morning also, they survive very well. You know? Some people, they smoke and smoke and smoke for 30 years, they don't get lung cancer. <laughs> Where some people... They take good care of that. They go, my ex-boss was like that. My ex-boss, uh, uh, he doesn't smoke. He's a, he's, a, he's a tennis player. He likes to swim. He takes good care of everything. But he got lung cancer. When he discovered he has lung cancer, it's four, stage four. I mean, so when you look at life, life is very complex things. Yeah? And uh, some who are at the peak of their career, like this man, suddenly deprived of their lives. In some cases, some people, they go bankrupt. I'm sure you have seen that all the time. And because of all these differences, that puts sometimes some of us into thinking mode. What is actually life? Why is my life like that? Why me? Why not the other person? You know, sometimes that's what... And it is because of all these thoughts that lead to some of us start to think about spiritualism. And a lot of Chinese don't care much about religion. But when it comes to a time like this, they start to search. And when we Buddhists do not reach out to them, that's where the Christian took them away. Yeah. True. Uh, but these are real life questions. Dharma is for you to apply to your daily life to basically put that back into a perspective for you. Otherwise, Dhamma has no use. Dhamma has to be applied in your life, in how you see life. So when we look at this, there is a very interesting sutta, if you have a chance to look at it. It's called the Chula Kama Vibhanga Sutta. And uh, if you study this sutta, it basically goes back to a very important things about our perspective of life. In Buddhism, we say men are never born equal. I know you see, wow, how can that be? We are all fighting for men are born equal, right? And that's because the West, the Western revolutions basically challenge rights. And because of that, they talk about men are born equal. But as far as Buddhism is concerned, if you understand the law of karma, men are never born equal. Even you are born in the same family, you look quite alike. Maybe your sister are more clever than you. Maybe your brother, on certain things, he has a certain ability you don't have. Yeah? Your other sister can sing very well. You can't even croak. <laughs> I mean, that's the reality in life. So when we understand the law of karma from a Buddhist perspective, this is very real. Man 
is never born. When I say men, means women. Uh, let's try to be a little bit more. <laughs> These days, when you talk anything, you have to be very careful. And then, then they say, uh, you're sexist. You know, <laughs> you don't talk about women. When we talk about men in general, man is never born equal. Now, Suba, who is a student of Todia, uh, have some doubts about life. And as a Brahmin, he went over to see the Buddha. And when he saw the Buddha, uh, he did all the right thing, pay respect, and sit at one side and ask the Buddha questions. So as Subha was sitting there, he said to the Blessed One, which is the Buddha and the Tathagata, Master Gautama, what is the reason? What is the cause? Why baseness and excellence are seen among human beings, among human race? Baseness and excellence. Some people are very, very charm. Some people are fantastic. Oh, oh yeah. Why? And then he asked the question, why some people are very short life? Temia. Some people, Tengmia. Very long life. Very long life. Why some are very sickly and some are very healthy? They don't need supplement. They don't need yoga. They don't need well, Zumba, whatever bar that you have. They don't need all that. Why some people are very ugly and some people are beautiful? You know, some people, they are born by nature. They don't even need to do any touch-up. They are beautiful. Some people, after all the touch-up, nothing makeup. <laughs> so that's what it is. Some people are not influential at all. Some people are very influential. You know, some people, when they talk, nobody listens. Some people, when they, other, they, they, when they wing their eyes, everybody knows what to do. You know, some people are very influential. And some people are poor and some people are rich. Some people are low-born, some people are high-born. That means they are born in a low-status society. Some people are born in high-status society. Some people are not so smart, they are stupid. And they cannot uh, dis discern. Uh? They cannot differentiate between the good and bad. They don't have that wisdom. So Subha was very interested. So he asked the Buddha this question. Why? Uh? Why human race like that? What? And, of course, uh, the Buddha answered. Of course, the sutta is very long. I'm just extracting some parts of it. The Buddha says, Being are the owners of their actions, as to their actions, born of their actions, related through their actions, and have their actions as their arbitrator. What it means is, whatever is happening to our life now is actually our own actions. In short, we own whatever we have put in. So the past affects the present. The present affects the future. And action is what differentiates being in terms of baseness and excellence. That's what the Buddha explained. Now you can go through the entire uh, sutta if you want to. Uh, in our Dharma cell group or in our sutta group, we do discuss in detail about this, but just to give you. Now, because people could not understand the differences there are a lot of people who attribute all these unfairness and differences in life to God. God has a plan for you. Mm, that's why you're here in BGF. <laughs> so, the, the, so they have, they try to answer these questions of inequality and unfairness and, uh, of life through a very simple approach. It's about God. So don't question so much. And even if you go through very hard time, that's part of God's plan, is to test you, is to whatever it is. And if you're really successful, God basically grace you, and you know, you know, with all this whatever success and things like that. Some people try to understand that, and some people try to uh, you know understand. They couldn't understand all these things. They do things like you know, oh, bad luck, like you know. So they begin to blame. Sorry, you're born in the year of the pig, therefore you are so stupid, you know. <laughs> or you're born in the year of cow, sorry man, you have to work hard every year, every day until, you know, I look at your star, probably you have to work until your retirement and the end of your life. Um, some people blame those things and attribute that to zodiac, to stars, to whatever it is. And, and also blame their name, like my name. Huat Chai, right? Very nice name, isn't it? Yeah? Yeah. But I have to tan, right? <laughs> tan me I have to wait, right, in Hokkien. <laughs> so, and there are a lot of people who are very particular about name, especially Chinese, the stroke, the dot, and whatever it is. And they try to so-called change their fate. 
their life yeah, by doing a couple of these things they call Chuan Yin. Yeah. And there are people who cannot understand this. They blame their parents. So sometimes in the, in the spur of the moment, they're angry with their parents. They say, why do you give birth to me? <laughs> they will ask questions like that. Huh? Uh, if you don't give birth to me, I don't have today's problem. Okay, that's what they say. You know? They blame on ancestor. That's even worse. Huh? Your uh, 18 generations are all like that. No wonder. You know, why do I have to marry you in the first place? It could be that. And of course, some people, they blame their feng shui. Their feng shui is not good, so they go back and look at the house. Maybe I should shift the door slightly slanting. <laughs> Maybe I should put, uh, 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 what do you call, chao chai mao in front of the house or whatever they do, you know. So that's what people do. Now, from the Buddhist perspective, as what we understand, uh, uh, Kama Chula Kama Bibanga uh, Babanga Sutta itself, we have if you notice the Buddha mentioned that the differences of what we go through in life is not because of God, it's not because of your ancestors, it's not because of your name, it's not because of all those things that we just mentioned, but it has a lot to do with your actions. What you did in the past affects where you are today. And if you are not careful what you are doing today will have impact on what will happen tomorrow, next year, next five years, next ten years, fifteen, twenty years down the road. Now, Buddhists understand life through the law of karma. And as what I said, the past, the present, and the future are also interrelated. Now, one of the important point that we need to know as Buddhists is when we talk about past, we always tend to refer to the distant past. But there is this thing called the present past. Sorry, I'm not teaching tenses here. <laughs> the present past. Present past means you are not well today, health-wise. It may not deal to your past karma. This one the Buddha also has mentioned in the Sutta. Not everything happened in our life is due to past karma. Here, past refers to distant past. A lot of the karma that we do today also can be due to the present past. What you did 15 years ago, what you did 30 years ago, also affects how you are today. And in fact, some of you may have come, eh? those of you who are of my era, if you're born in the 50s, 60s and 70s, we don't have much during those years. And some of you came from very poor family. How did you rise yourself to where you are today? Is it because of your past karma? The past karma would have made you perhaps be born in a very poor family, that your father would have to work maybe two jobs or all around the clock in order to, to, to basically bring you up. But where you are today is not due to your past karma, perhaps. It could be due to your present past karma. That means 30 years ago, you did what you need to do. You studied very hard. <laughs> 25 years ago, you started your job and you worked very hard and you did all the right things. 15 years ago, you got a big breakthrough in your career or in your business. Therefore, you are where you are today. So one of the important things that we need to understand about karma is it's not everything due to past, distant past. It could be due to this very life. And sometimes the kind of sickness that we have, the cancer that we have, the whatever sickness that we have, is not due to the past karma. It could be this very life itself. For the last 30 years, your lifestyle, the food that you take, the kind of activities that you do, perhaps will cause you to be in that situation. Just to clarify that, so that we have uh, the proper perspective. So our idea, views, and standard of morality then transform into a speech and action. So it depends on how strong is your moral values. If your moral values are not very strong, it will be demonstrated to your, the way you talk, when you talk about your ideas, 
There are some people when you talk to them, they say, oh, you like that. Uh, uh, he is a CEO of a company. How can he talk like that? You know? Uh, or oh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a senior management people. How can he treat people like that? That has a lot to do with moral values that they have. And because of the moral values that they have, either right or not so right, or somewhere in between, that will be translated into his speech and action. So far, all right? You okay with that? Okay. Now, because human being does not have strong moral foundation, especially in our modern age today, our standard of morality varies from time to time, from place to place. And that's human being. Uh, human behaviors in a temple and outside temple are not the same, right? Now you're all sitting very quiet, quiet. Maybe no bad thoughts also because you're listening to a talk, you have the slides to look at, all your senses are focusing on wholesome things. But the moment this talk ends, as you walk out, somebody double park your car there. <laughs> Sounds familiar? And then you horn, he doesn't respond, there's nobody coming out, and for the next five minutes, you were rushing to fetch your kids or whatever other things. Oh, it's a different world altogether. All that you learn eh, about Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha is now eh, no more in, in use really. The real thing in use is uh, the anger speech. So our, our standard of morality sometimes can differ depending on environment. If you are not strong morally, because that can basically easily switch, eh? swift. Uh, if only men can regard those who do not observe morality, like disproving those who do not bathe, do not brush their teeth, do not clean themselves and things like that, then we will be a better society. But unfortunately, our society today, when we see people have some moral issues, we do not say anything. Moral issue can range from corruption to any other things in the society. We do not say anything at all because we say it's not the right thing to say or we should not be saying. Somebody else should be saying that. Yeah. Right. People who support it also, not just Chinese, we say Tong Liu <laughs> Ewu. They are the same gang or sometimes they are worse than that, therefore they support it. But people with strong moral foundation, sometimes that's the problem. We do not speak out. We do not put our stand. We do not disagree. We do not disapprove whatever actions done by others. We keep silence. We keep the noble silent. Kononia want to be like the Buddha. The Buddha has noble silence. Now, society with low morality, I'm sure you know, this one I don't have to say, leads to a lot of social ills, especially corruptions and all these things. I remember two, three years ago before the election, I went to give a talk uh, for the Buddhists, representing the Buddhist interfaith. Uh, and the Mufti on the Grisimbilan was there. It was organized by the Muslim group. And the topic was about social ills. They all were talking about, you know, all those... Uh, moral issue, la, especially drugs, la, uh, men and women together. La, they were talking. My focus at that time was not on that. I just told the most of them are Muslims down there because it's an interfaith organized by them. I said the biggest social ills in the society three years ago. The, yes, those things are problems. Huh? Drugs problem, uh, those uh, the, you know, boy and girl having affair and then the they give birth to child and they abandon the child and all this. These are social problems. But I told them at that point, and the biggest problem social is in the society it are not just that. Biggest problem is corruption. And that was three years ago in one of the forums. And Mufti Nagrisilan was there. Uh, these are, this has a lot to do with our moral standing. Yeah? Uh, now, Sadly, our society do not tolerate those who break the moral rules, but sometimes silently, quietly, in a way, endorse it. What are they? Man who boasts of his conquest with women is not condemned. Oh, I tell you, wow, you know, last week I just went with one girl, you know, wow, I tell you, it's a special girl, and you know, I start to tell a lot of stories. And then, of course, some of us listen. We may not agree, but then we smile along the way. Wow, oh, Luchin Di Hai, <laughs> yeah, very good. <laughs> We, we, we endorse them sometimes. Lying is accepted from the highest level to the petty shopkeeper. And we don't stand up for some of these moral issues 
we allow it to pass. All right? Killing as hobbies is admired. Oh, especially YouTube these days, you see the show, oh, big fish they caught. Uh, recently, I just got a social media camera. I don't know whether it's true. And I say his brother-in-law caught a very big fish. And you, did you re receive that? Eh? And, and and he put, he, he took so proud of the big fish. He took and put it in the freezer when he went back. One or two days after that, he went into coma. <laughs> I don't know whether the story is true, lah, But that's what been been circulated, lah. But it's an interesting story. So he was in coma, and the guy said in the things, uh, the doctor tried to find, they couldn't find the reason why he was in that situation. And then they went to consult some mediums or whatever, all those. And the medium says, you better let go the big fish. This fish is so huge, he caught it. So he, he basically, they follow, and he said, miraculously, he took the frozen fish to the sea again and let it go. The, f the fish became alive. Now, how true it is, I don't know. Uh, uh, I became alive, and the story goes that after that, the brother-in-law wake up from the coma. And after that, it says, he advised people, don't go fishing anymore. So, I mean, there are stories like that. Lah. So, whether it's true or not, I have I, I, no, no verification here. But uh, there could be incidents like that. And big scale theft is respected. Right? When a robbery is done on a bank, of course, these days it's harder to rob a bank. Uh, and also, not much of value. Banks' money today is small to the robbers because our standard has been raised to billion, billion. Uh, so robbing a few hundred thousand is small money already, consider. Huh? Malaysian standard has risen to billions already. <laughs> so uh, we, we hardly hear bank robberies these days, but in the 70s, 80s, it's quite common. And if they can rob wow, 700,000 well, or 1 million at that time, was considered a big thing. And they said, wow, very, very high. So that's why those days in the 70s, those of you remember, uh, of course, those of you born after the 70s, you would not know. Lah. There's this Malaysian Robin Hood called Botachin. Right? The Malaysian Robin Hood called Botachin. Actually, his real name is not Botachin. And his nickname also, Botak, came about. You know how the word Botak came about? He was not bald headed. He was, he was, he was, he was caught in Bentong uh, Perting or which new village there. He went hiding there. And he was caught there. But anyway, he was not Botak, but he was called Botak Chin. And the reason why he was called Botak Chin was because at that time, during the 70s, uh, Tun, Tun Abdul Razak went to China uh, to make friends with Mao Zedong. And that's where our relationship started between China and Malaysia. And he also started Barisan Nasional. So these guys, life was very hard during the 70s. Jobs are hard to come by. So some of these guys, because of their moral values are not so good, they started to do things like that. And so he robbed many people, banks and things like that. And he called himself and the rest of his team, Bota, Barisan Orang Tak Ada Kerja. <laughs> That's how his name Bota Chin came about. Yeah. So he was a smart guy, but anyway, but Society, during those days, even until today, uh, people admire those who can steal money from whatever it is, lah, including corruptions and things like that. But the, the whole system, the whole value system in our society has changed. And uh, to a certain extent that there are people who does all these things, they are admirers and there are followers. And that's the biggest challenge in our society today. And drinking is re regarded as a mark of a leader. <laughs> okay. Now, because of that, we say it's a confused society we are in. Now, let's talk a little bit about, because the topic is why bother to have moral foundation? Let's look at the Buddhist morality first. Now, Buddhist morality is not invention of human mind uh, like many other society they have different tribal, ethnic, and man-made codes that we know. Yeah? In 
because man-made code may change from time to time. For example, if you were to kill, uh, or if a Japanese were to kill any one of you in 1940s, it's okay. But if the Japanese were to kill any one of us here today, it's not okay. Because of two different eras, the values was different, yeah? the, the importance was different. All right? uh, so some society, their value system differ. Uh, and we do face a lot of this in Malaysia. To the Chinese family, wearing a short skirt is okay. To another community, it's not okay. It's a value which is created by human beings. Yeah? What they see as morally correct or morally not correct. I'm sure you know what I mean. Huh? So, Buddhist morality is based not on cultural, but based on the law of cause and effect. That's our morality. So every time when we say something is good or not good, it's not because somebody say it's good or somebody say it's not good. It's not based on that. It's not because some monks say it's good, some monks say it's not good. It's because of law of karma. That's our morality. And according to the manner, it affects oneself and others. So what is good morality according to Buddhism? Any ideas? What is good morality? Yes. If it benefits you, but it does not benefit others, is that good? It benefits a lot of others, but it does not benefit you. Is it good? It benefits others. Now, benefit here means wholesome things. Huh? <laughs> benefit others, and it also benefits you. It brings goodness to others. It brings goodness to you. It brings happiness to others. It brings happiness to you. It brings joy to others. It brings joy to you. Wholesome joy. Uh, as long as they are there, it's a good deeds, it's a good moral standard. All right? And good in the. Uh, and normally, again, not just parties involved. Our definition of good Buddhist morality also, that's a time space factor. It's good in the beginning, it's good in the middle, it's good at the end. So, you come to BGF for a Dharma talk today or any other day. So when you come here, your intention was good, you're happy? Then you sit down in the talk, you listen to whoever the speaker is, and something strikes your mind, something gives you some impression and good, you know, influence and impact along the way. You feel good about it while you are sitting down listening to the talk. It's good in the middle. Then you walk away from BGF after you finish the Dhamma talk. You go back, you have your lunch, and you were thinking about one or two things that that speaker talked about. And you feel great about it. Yeah, how come I didn't think about that? That should have been my guiding principle when I was doing this or doing that. Do you feel good after that? So, it has to be a time frame and a space involved over a period of time. That's, if it lasts that, then that fulfills the criteria of good. So, not just party involved, but also time frame and the space itself. And as far as Buddhist morality is, is concerned, it is embodied in the five precepts. Very basic. I'm sure all of you have gone through that. I don't need to go into detail. Uh, so, an, anyone new to Buddhism here? No worry, I won't ask you a question. Oh, so I say new after word, he asked me a question. Anyone new? Very new. How new? <laughs> but do you know about the five precepts? Yes, so the, not so new. La. <laughs> new is complete. You know, what are they chanting about this? Panati, Pata, Vera, Mani, you know, Adina, Dana, Vera, Mani. What are they chanting about? But you know those things, right? So new, but not so new. La. Eh? Mm, okay, but anyway, anything not clear, please ask me, <laughs> especially for the new ones. Now, and one of the important aspects, sorry, eh? one of the important aspects of building strong Buddhist moral foundation is. It's not about coming here just to do the chanting every Sunday and every day at home. It's about living it. Can I repeat this? It's not about the doing the chanting. 
how loud you chant, how accurate you chant. Of course, it does matter. But more importantly is how you live with those moral standards that has been set for us. Now, the five precepts. Uh, I want to take photo. Okay, quickly take. <laughs> the five precepts. Abstain from, uh, you know the five, right? Killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, falsehood. This one especially. In our digital world, this is needed very much. When we talk about observing the fourth precept, Musa Wada Veramani, it's not just about telling lies. What else? Harsh speech. What else? Sorry? Useless talk. In, in other words, gossip. What else? Slandering, talk bad a lot of people. This is called uh, personality suicide. You know, you basically go and murder the person through the person. So, all these things are very common. And today, it makes it so easy to practice it. All the slandering and uh, gossiping through what? Social media. The Facebook and the Instagram and many other gram that you can think of. Our media or communication has changed, but the fundamental remains the same. People still break the four precepts through a different media only. And better still today, you can hide. Those days you want to, you know, you want to have harsh speech against a person, you must go to the person and say, I dislike you, you know, campaign, you are a useless lady, why are you? We, we have to do that face to face. Today, you don't need to do that. You can hide under anonymous and then post something there and make the whole world get angry with you or get angry. You can do that. The social media has made it even easier for you to break any of these precepts, especially the fourth precepts. That's why be careful. While the social media, the digital world, the technology has made us you know, a lot more advanced in many things, in the way we do business, in the way we do many things. But it also has pulled us many steps behind in terms of our moral values because it becomes so convenient to break the four precepts, actually. And a lot of people also do a lot of idle talk, post up one picture. Is the sky green or blue today? And then you know, no, I think it's a little bit green. No, it's a little bit more blue. No, no, it's, I think it's turquoise or whatever. And then they argue about that. No, no, you stupid. You, can't you see it is a little bit more green? It's all idle talk. But you see that in social media. And then people get angry about that. And then they unfriend or they block. <laughs> right? So even in the modern world today, we, without we knowing it, it slowly, basically, degenerate our moral values, especially in terms of pleasant speech, in terms of rightful speech, in terms of kind speech. We have lost all that because the media has made it so easy. And when we are not aware, we are not mindful, we get caught into that. All right? Now, the importance of having a strong moral foundation, I have still have not gone to the core of why the topic, why bother to have moral. But so far, I've just explained that's Buddhist morality, that the five precepts are very core. In fact, if you look at the five precepts, not negatively, there are some people who became Buddhists, they say, why are you all Buddhists so negative? Cannot do this, cannot do that, cannot, you know, must not kill, must not this, must not. very negative. But if you look at the five precepts per se is a very important guiding rules for us to live in harmony with each other. When we talk about five precepts, actually we are talking about honoring and respecting the rights. When you do not kill or try your best not to kill, you are respecting the right of that person or that being to live. It's about respecting that right to live. Therefore, you, it's not right for you to take away that life. It's about respecting that. 
when you do not take what is not given to you, is respecting the right of others to own the thing and enjoy the thing, whatever he has and his or hers. So when you take away that things from the back, we are breaking that basic, fun, uh, that basic understanding of the society that people have right to own what they want to own. You have no right to just take away like that without asking, without getting permission, without uh, in, a, in a proper and lawful manner. So when we look at the five precepts, I'm not sure you have thought about this. When we practice the five precepts, it's about respecting the rights of others to live, to own, to have that purity within them, you know, to know the truth, yeah, and to be in a mindful situation. It's about the rights. Yeah? Now, why is having a strong moral foundation important? I mean, all of you are told to, to chant the five precepts, observe the five precepts, but why is it so important? Is it because you're afraid somebody there will punish you if you don't do? Then it is not called precepts. It is called commandment. Commandments in other religions basically say you, it command you, you must follow, you must obey. If you don't obey, there's a punishment for you. That's commandment. The Buddhists don't look at the precepts like that because if you break the precept, which we will, we are not fully enlightened one yet. We will break the precepts from time to time, sometimes mindfully break, sometimes unmindfully break. We are, un we are unmindful, we break the precepts. We will break. But that's the difference between commandment and precepts. So why do we observe? Why do we need to have a good moral foundation? Any idea? Let's hear one or two and then I'll show mine. <laughs> to get jhanas, wow, okay. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. It, it leads you, it's a foundation for you, for your higher cultivation. Yes, that's true. So that's why when you go for retreats, observing precepts, not just five, are very essential. Because when you go for retreats, one of the important things is to guard your senses. What can guard your senses? Precepts. Not just five. Eight. Ten, depending on well, whoever is practicing. Well. So the precepts are there to guide. What else? Come, let's hear one or two before. Yes. Yeah. True, correct? The precepts are there to guide us to, to have all those things uh, so that it, we, we can live a much happier life. What else? Why do we need to have wrong, strong? A peace of mind, yes, of course. Anyone who breaks any of the five precepts, your mind will be disturbed very easily. Yeah? So if you do practice five precepts, you find that generally you're a calmer person. All right? Uh, Yes? True. If you have strong moral foundation through the precepts, for example, as a tool, you find that you have a lot more integrity. People trust you better. Yeah, they know this. That's why it, in the course of my, me doing my own business, uh, sometimes we go and see certain clients, we know they have integrity issue, and it becomes a very important decision for us. Do we want the business or do we want to walk away? And we decide to walk away because we know we smell something fishy, we smell something not right. As far as I'm concerned, business is still good, but I, I mean, if I can get the business, it's fantastic, but then some business you can live without. Okay, so it, it's about integrity. What else? Why do we need to have a strong moral foundation? Okay, good to maintain the society you know, in a harmonious way. That has a lot to do with respecting the rights. Remember I talk about? Yeah. Uh, what else? Sorry? Yes, 
Indeed, it is for our own protection. People who observe the precepts more faithfully, without they knowing it, they are more well protected. Uh, normally, people who do a lot more wholesome things, your auras are stronger. Uh, something you cannot see, like you need a machine to see the aura, the colors, you know. Your auras, but scientifically, they have done research on these people who are wholesome in general. Uh, their, their brain waves are different, their entire body auras are different. And these auras, this energy called positive energy, is the one that could dispel certain negative forces. In that sense, it protects you, but more importantly, it protects you in terms of where you stand in relation to the challenges you face in life. You meet with somebody who has very low moral foundation, you somehow get that kind of sensation. I don't want to deal with him, I don't want to be with him, I don't want to mix with him. In that way, it protects you. What else? Yeah. Yes. So in short, let me just recap. What you're trying to say is, commandments lead us to compliance. They need to comply. If they don't, then there will be consequences based on whatever that divine force has stated. Whereas for us to practice the precepts as part of our moral foundation, it's not because we're afraid, like I said, somebody going to shoot an arrow at you and uh, give you some, some, some thunder and lightning and then boom, you go, that's it, you know. It's not about that, it's about, we understand and that, that this is important, not just for me, but for others and for the whole sentient being. That understanding is needed, the mindfulness is needed when you practice that. More so, uh, more over the compliant issues that you have to follow and you have to obey. All right? Now, let's move on. We need strong moral foundation because it enables men to live together in a civilized society with mutual respect. I've spoken about that. Uh, the moment the society have no respect for each other, one by one of the precepts will be easily broken. In a war-torn society where people do not respect each other anymore, any of the five precepts can be broken anytime. People can kill, people can rape, people can just doing all kinds of looting and take away things from others. In a society where there are no laws, no proper law, at the same time moral laws are very weak, it will happen. So part of our Buddhist contribution to society, and all of you I have part of it, is if you observe precepts, don't underestimate, I alone cannot do much. If you observe precepts, if your family observes precepts, we have lesser people who contribute to the problem in the society. You must think like that. Don't think that I'm too small to change the society. You have an impact. And if a society, according to Buddhism, a lot of people are not practicing moral foundation, that society is a problematic society. There will be moral degeneration 
there will be a lot of social problems, there will be social unrest, and a lot of things will happen. And collectively, if the society has people who are bad, who do not observe the basic precepts and things like that, the entire aura of the country will be affected. And according to Buddhism, if the country is not ruled by good leaders and king and the citizens who have strong moral foundations, the season won't come in the rightful manner. In today's world, it could be climatal change. The rain don't come at the right time. The crop don't grow at the right time. There will be famine, there will be other issues. There will be war. So, if you pull that all back, it always goes back to one individual, all of you. You need to make sure that you practice good, strong moral foundation, not just for yourself, on a more selfish manner, is for yourself, but on the bigger scale manner, is for you to contribute to a better society. Of course, that will have to start with you in a sm smaller, bigger, smaller, bigger scale, your family. And a smaller and a, and a bigger, bigger scale will be a society that you live in and the country as a whole. So, it's important to have strong moral foundation, not just for our own good. If that's the kind of society you want to live in, that you can walk without much fear. And when people talk, you do not doubt whether they are saying the right thing or not. They are lying to you or not. I think we all have a moral duty to do is to observe the moral and to have that strong moral foundations. I have many clients who dealt with me and they are happy with me. Not that I want to boast, but I think they are happy because you say about integrity, you say about they, they think they can trust you and they think that the things that you promise you will deliver. That's important. And we call it integrity, but that's part of what you promise you deliver is part of the four precepts. The four precepts. When you tell a client, I will give you the report by Monday, and then you don't come on Monday with the report, you have no integrity. And then not only that, you come up with a whatever grandmother story after that. So one led to after another. But if you can uphold that, you notice that even people who deal with you like to deal with you because of your moral foundation. This is a practical side of taking the precepts into your daily living. Observing precept is nothing mystical, spiritually mystical. Wow, you know, yeah, I observe this precept, all the stars will shine. It's not about that. It's about your life, how you relate to people. So far, all right? Okay, that's why you must have a strong moral foundation. Two, sila is a foundation towards living a peaceful and happy life. I think all of us want money. We want to be successful. But unfortunately, people who have no strong moral foundation, they are very unscrupulous. They will do whatever they think is right just to get it. I've seen that a lot in the corporate world. For the last many years when I was in the corporate world, I see a lot of people, because they want to climb up, they will do anything. They will say anything just to step on somebody and to go up. And sometimes slandering, do anything that they want because you just want to go up. But for us as Buddhists, you know, while we want to be successful, we want to have money, we want to grow, go up, we want to do whatever we want to do in order to achieve what we want, the important guiding principle is it's not about just that. It's about living a blameless life. So what if you have a lot of money staying in Tropicana? Sorry, I know of him, those people tell you Tropicana. <laughs> <laughs> so what if you stay in Tropicana in a big bungalow but every day you're worried whether the, every time the car pass by and stop in front of your house you're worried whether somebody is coming after you I'm not saying all people in Tropicana like that just give an example huh? so, <laughs> so what if you have nice big buildings uh, with a swimming pool at the side nice big car in front of your house but every day you live your life it's a blameful life. So moral foundations not just help us to be successful, but when you enjoy that success, you enjoy that peace of mind. That's important. 
So we, we need to observe the precepts and have a strong moral foundation. Uh, again, it's not, nothing to do with religious here. It's to understand that there's a difference between religious and spiritualism. A religious person will faithfully bow down, chant the five precepts, and chant as loud as he can or as correct as he can. That's being religious. And he'll tell you, hey, you chanted wrongly. Huh? This one is panatipata, not panatipata, wrong. That's being religious. But being spiritual means how do you take that and make it work for you in your life that will either transform you to a better person, that helps to protect you from harm, that helps you to elevate you to be a more successful and happy person in life. That's what the precept is for. It's not just something mystical, religiously, we need to comply. It's for our living. Now, third reason. It is the foundation towards higher spiritual achievement. Uh, as what he said just now is about jhana. You see, moral foundations are very important. Some of you, I know, at your certain age, you, you got no incumbences anymore, right? Children are all grown up already. All debts are paid for already. Uh, everything is settled already. So you are living now the, the glorious twilight years of your life. I use the word glorious because nothing to worry about. Okay? And some of you are now thinking about your spiritual attainment and achievement. But spiritual attainment and achievement are hard to come by if you do not have a strong moral foundation. Not just the time you want to practice, let's say you want to practice meditation, or oh, now I observe precepts, sometimes it doesn't work that well because, because of your current past. The last 20, 30, 30 years you've been doing a lot of not so good things. And now you decide that I want to go for my spiritual. Sometimes you feel that these are the time where it becomes a distraction to you if you have not been observing that. Uh, Chinese we say, you have a lot And some of this chang ai affects neither xiu xing, your cultivation. So if you can start having a good moral foundation at a very young age, especially for those people who are younger, better still. Because it helps not just spiritually, uh, not just worldly sense for you to be successful but although at the same time spiritually it gives you a very smooth you know take off runway in your spiritual path yeah, to go into your stages that you want now more importantly when you have a strong moral foundation it sets a good condition for success you find that actually people who observe the precepts are more well received and trusted and because of the good deeds that you do by observing the precepts all the time and you've got good aura along the way, you find that sometimes as you do things, there are always this auspicious person that comes to your life. In Chinese, we say kui ren. And don't underestimate auspicious person in your life because our life is not always smooth all the time. Man. Agree? Yeah. No matter how smart you are, how hard you try, there are times there are obstacles. There are times there are challenges. There are times there are problems. And it is in those moments that there are problems and obstacles and challenges. Somehow, if you are a morally strong person, because of the seeds you have planted all through the years of practice, the precepts, Sometimes these seeds germinate at the time you want it. And without you knowing, eh, yeah, I went through that problem, but thankfully, you know, that particular person come and help. I got my problem solved. And, and some people in your life, you know, eh, they only appear at that period of time. After that, the whole thing is over. You also forget about the person. The person also no more in your picture. Very strange. These are the auspicious people in your life. And they come about because of your good moral foundation. It attracts good people. And it attracts solutions when time you are facing with problems. So, 
Strong moral foundations are very important. And sometimes people who observe a lot of precepts and observe honestly, even the devas protects you. Sometimes you're caught in some difficult situation, dangerous situation, accident. Somehow you survive. And then you ask, there seems to be like something there, but you don't, cannot explain that. Even the deva sometimes protect good people who have strong moral foundation. So don't ever underestimate every time you come to BGF and just chant Pana Tipata, ah, yeah, same old thing, la, never mind. La. Anyway, I can remember by heart Pana Tipata. But it doesn't mean anything. I want you to, after today, when you go back, look at the precepts in a very different manner. You're doing it not just as a religious requirement. You're doing it because it has a lot of value to our life and to the society as a whole. Okay? Let's move on. So these are the five precepts. Uh, I'm talking about the rights, remember? The various rights. And when we talk about strong moral foundation, again, not just the law or karma talks about it, not just the five precepts talks about it in terms of, even in the Noble Eightfold Path, the Buddha also emphasized that we should have a good, strong moral foundation through our thought, speech, and action. And where is this found? Right speech, right action, right livelihood. Again, the Buddha re-emphasized the importance of having a strong moral foundation in the Eightfold Path. You must observe these three and live these uh, this three important perfections, the perfection of speech, the perfection of action, the perfection of right livelihood. So, again, in Buddhism, moral foundation is strongly emphasized in another way. When we look at this, Sabba Papasa Akaranang Kusalasa Upasampada, Satchitta Pariyodapanang, Etang Buddhana Sasanang. Now, the Buddha explained all Buddhas. It doesn't matter this Buddha or future Buddhas or the past Buddha. They only taught these three things. Number one is avoid evil, do good, purify the mind. And out of these three, all religion talk about the first one and the second one. Avoid evil, do good. The only thing is their motivation is different. If you're a God believer, you avoid evil, do good because of God. But Buddhism don't do it because of God. Buddhism do it because we understand why we should not do some unwholesome things, why we should practice some wholesome thing, because it has impact on you, people around you, the society, the entire universe itself. Now, again, if you look at this Dhammapada verse 183, yeah, the Buddha emphasized the importance to have a strong moral foundation before you can even talk about purifying your mind which is at a, another level. And the purifying of the mind is the one that differentiates us from the other religion. All other religion of the world talks about the first two. Of course, their motivation is different. Buddhism wanted us to go one step beyond that. Avoiding evil, doing good according to the Buddha standard, not good enough you have to go to the next level called purify your mind. Why? Because it is in the mind where the greed, hatred and delusion rested. Therefore, when you purify your mind, you are taking out that greed, taking out that hatred, taking out that delusion from your mind. When it is taken out from your mind, I mean, literally speaking, it's taken out from your mind, you purify it, your mind don't have those evil roots, Chinese, we say, Zan chao bu chu ken, chun feng chui yu shen. When you cut your grass without pulling the roots. Cutting grass is like avoid evil, do good. Purify the mind is about uprooting the roots. So if you uproot the roots from the soil, no matter what rain and, and, and sun comes, it will not grow back again. Alright, that's why it is important. So, Rightfully speaking, when we talk about a strong moral foundation from a Buddhist perspective, it's not about these two alone. Actually, we should include the third one. 
Only then you have a strong moral foundation. Avoiding evil, do good, very easy. Sorry, yeah, to say that word easy because not not all of you avoid evil, do good. Why? Condition can provide you with that. The moment you come in to be just sit down here, you're quite quiet already. You avoid evil, do good. Of course, some of you along the way, your mind be thinking other thing. I can't see lah. Uh, but I assume you are avoiding evil, do good. But the roots are still there. That's why the moment when you walk out, people double park, the roots activated. So, in our practice of strong moral foundation, it's just, just a moral, not just a moral foundation, but strong moral foundation in Buddhism, it's not just about avoid evil, do good, which is quite common, but the third element of purifying your mind becomes very important. All right? So, the practice of morality in Buddhism, uh, there are many, uh, uh, in the Eightfold Path, even in the Mangala Sutta. uh, If you study the Mangala Sutta, there are many of them, uh, Vinayo, Susikito, Subhasita, Iyavacha, if you can remember the verse, uh, verse verse what? Verse 4. He just learned verse 4. So, verse 4 of the you know, uh, Mangala Sutta talks about having discipline in not to perform the ten uh, uh, unwholesome deeds through your thoughts, speech, and actions. So, again, if you look through Mangala Sutta, the Buddha emphasized a lot. In fact, the whole thing about Buddhism evolved around avoid evil, do good, purify your mind, and it's about building a strong moral foundation. All right, nothing mystical, spirit. Uh, religiously mystical. Yeah. In fact, the Buddha was not a religiously mystical person. Yeah. He's not something like very God-like that people, but somehow culturally Asians, we always want to make some people to become very God-like. Yeah. So even Quan Kong, who is just an ordinary, <laughs> but the Chinese will pray there as like a God, because that's Asian. Anything which is good, they personify it, they make it like a religious... But it's not. The Buddha was basically a person who cares about happiness and success in life. The Buddha is a person who cares about you not to fall into suffering and ask you how to get out of that suffering. And he teaches you ways to do that. All right? So again, there are many more. I just would like to flag out just to show you that in Mangala Sutta, many a time the Buddha talks about Righteous conduct, blameless action, abstain from evil, stay first in virtues. You can see that a lot in the Mangala Sutta. And also in the Parabhava Sutta, the Downfall Sutta. This is a Sutta the Buddha say, you want to fail in life, do all these things. Okay? So the Parabhava Sutta, the Buddha says, the vicious are dear to him. In the virtues, he finds nothing pleasing. Yeah, he favors the creed of the vicious. This is the cause of one downfall. You ask them to come to be jack, I ah, no need la, waste time, Sunday sleep more, la, you, know? you know. Ask them to come for retreat, no need la, you know. Ask them to come and observe the eight oh, no need la. And then you ask them to go somewhere, oh, 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 got party, okay, let's go. So the vicious uh, is, is dear to him, the virtuous to him is not something that he, he looks for. Now the Buddha says, if a person who are inclined to that, that means they are inclined to immoral things. It's a cause of their downfall. Okay? So, developing morality. The famous excuse. Ah, this one I see some of you got. No? Wow, easy to talk about. Precise. How not to break? Cannot laugh for working people like us. My job is sales. And every time I have to break the four precepts. Okay? <laughs> Difficult la, for businessmen like me. I, uh, you don't know one. Uh, you retire, you can talk a lot. La. I'm still doing business. Okay? Observe preset. Ah, no freedom. Le, you know, everything cannot. This one cannot, cannot, cannot. Ah. <laughs> Precepts are meant for those who have nothing better to do. <laughs> see, 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 all these uncle, aunties there. Ah, they got nothing better to do. Ah, some people give that kind of excuses. <laughs> Enjoy life first. What precepts? Stupid, you know, can enjoy life, don't enjoy life, go and you know, suffer yourself with precepts. <laughs> can, wait till I'm older. <laughs> uh, I don't know when you reach there, right? Uh, can, when I have finished learning Dharma, when are you going to finish learning Dharma? Some people say, yeah, yeah, can, when I finish learning Dharma. Uh, 
Why bother? Immoral people are also successful. Remember I started with that? All these are excuses. I'm appealing to all of you as Buddhists uh, not to look at the five precepts as another religious things, but look at that as an important guiding rules in your life, principles in your life that you must live with because it has a lot of benefit and that's why you need to have that strong moral foundation. Not because you're afraid to be punished by somebody, but because you know it benefits you, it benefits others, it benefits the entire environment and people. And it benefits you not just before, but now and also the future. That's for you need to observe that. So stop excuses, start executing. Okay? So don't just chant the five precepts, but be a little bit more mindful every time when you deal with people, deal with situations. So, uh, to execute, you need a couple of things. First, you need determination, aditana. So maybe today before you leave, as you bow, take your bow before you go out, or BGS says, I will try to mindfully, seriously practice the precepts. Have faith. Now, faith, the sadha is something that... Law of karma requires some element of understanding, but it also requires some element of faith. Sadda. Because it's only through faith that you say, okay, if I do good, good things will come to me. You must have that element of faith that is correct. Because the moment you don't have that faith, the law of karma doesn't work for you. That's why it doesn't work for some people because they don't believe in the law of karma. They think, why? And it doesn't, nah, and not true. Nah. All these are created by all those religious people, got nothing better to do. They want to control you, they give you all these principles. It's not about that. Right? And you need right effort. Okay, Samaviriya. You need patience to practice it. Uh, you won't get it right all the time. But it's okay. Important thing is when you break the precepts, number one, you must feel regret. Oh, oh I should, oh, I, 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 Number two, you must have that mindfulness to tell yourself, I should be more mindful the next time. Maybe next time when I talk to my boss, I shouldn't be talking like that. That, according to the precept, is harsh speech. Yeah? Yeah. Why did I raise my voice when I talk to my boss? my boss? Yes, I disagree with him, but I don't have to raise my voice so loud that the, the entire office hear. So you also don't give your, voice, your, your boss face. You don't give your boss face. The next thing, the boss will tell you you are faceless in his mind. It works that way. That's how the law of karma works. So you say, okay, today I raised my voice. I, I was disagreeing with him, but maybe there's a better way to, to put it across to him rather than raising my voice and my entire department look at me from the outside of the room. So that mindfulness has to be there when you practice the precepts. And with a lot of patience. And in Buddhism, whatever good that you practice, is always must be guided by wisdom. So practicing the five precepts also need wisdom. All right. Um, realizing our own mistake itself is a giant step towards progress in your practice. This external morality will one day be inseparable part of us. Yes, the five precepts looks like something from outside that we are reciting, we are practicing. One day, one fine day, you find that as you live your life, it's very natural of you not to break any of the five precepts. It takes time, of course. But it looks alien now. As you try to practice, it looks a little bit challenging. But if you are having all those five elements there, you find that you will be able to build your moral foundation stronger and stronger every day. That is important for your happiness and success. All right? So with that, I end my talk here. Any questions? Yes, please. Ah, okay. 
<laughs> I shouldn't have said that. Mm, now I'm letting myself in trouble. No, no, it's uh, not just sales. Yes. Let me give you my example. This, this has to do with your moral dilemma. It's called your moral dilemma. Whether it's first precept, second precept, third precept, fourth precept, doesn't matter. It's called the moral dilemma you're in as you work. I used to work with a US-based consulting firm in the 90s. And in our business at that time, we, we taught a lot to our client and customers to do this, to do this, to do this, and this, 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 this. And especially in the part of being a good leader, this is what it should be. Unfortunately, my boss wasn't the person that he preached about. You know, he, he could go to a client and talk about, oh, you all should be like that, like that, this should be the way. But back home in our own office, it was a totally two different world altogether. And of course, initially when things like that happened, I asked myself, why? Ah? And after a while, I know there is a behavioral pattern of that person. Now, that comes to a very important point. Whatever he does, he doesn't, whatever he says, he doesn't do it. Whatever he says, he doesn't mend it at home, in the office itself. And I asked myself this question, is, is he a hypocrite and am I a hypocrite? That's a very important question. And I asked myself, should I continue to work in this environment or should I move on? And of course, it is not an overnight decision that I want to move on, but over different things that happen again and again, and it gives you that impression, I think I can't work in this environment. Number one, my Buddhist value tells me this is not right. This is something that goes against the very thing that we believe in, or the company believe in. Now, of course, the money is good. Do you want to stay or do you want to move on? And uh, to a point you will realize that certain companies, certain bosses that you work with, if there is these moral issues, you have to make a very important decision whether to stay or to move on. Now sometimes because of the money, you need the money, you have no choice to stay on. And you have to ask also how long can you bear with that? Because if you are not careful, it eats into you. It is into you, your well-being. And not only that, you find that normally when there's a moral dilemma issue happen, in, at, especially in workplace, over a period of time, without you knowing it, it makes you an angrier person. You have a lot of unhappiness, you know, angry in you, anger in you. And that's not good for your development also. You will notice that, you know if you are careful. If not, somebody will tell you, why are you like that all the time now? Then you realize actually some of this anger comes because in response to a different moral values that your workplace have, your boss have, your company has, or the people around you have. And it manifested through your anger a lot of time. So to the question whether should you move on, I can't answer for you that, but you have to assess yourself. Are you happy there? Are you a better person? when you came in, or now you're a worse person as you're about to go out? That's a very important question to ask. But if you think you are a worse person, you're not as good as you used to be in terms of your personality and everything, I think it's time to move on, even though the money is good, which I did. Huh? Now, as to sales job, now, who says salesperson have to lie? That's the general myth that we have, that you want to be a successful salesperson, you have to lie. But good salespeople, and I do believe people will agree with me, good, do, I mean, good salesperson don't have to lie. They don't have to lie. If they have to lie to survive, something is wrong with the product, something is wrong with the, the company, the leadership of the company, or something is wrong with he himself. Because normally a good salesperson don't have to go to that path. Now, granted, there are times where your product is not as superior as other products. But then again, the pricing you may be better than the other product. Could be. 
you know, or certain other things you could have been better than that. What a good salesperson would do is to sell the value of that, whatever you can. And even if it's a second, second class product, there'll be a second class customer looking for second class products. Of course, the first class customer would not want to look for the second class. Well, maybe they, they may not want to get that high, high quality one. They also may not want to get a very low quality, your product smack right middle somewhere there. You can sell based on that proposition. Nobody says a good salesman has to lie. I'm part of my job doing my business. I also have to sell. I have to pitch for business. I have to go to my client and tell them why they need me. But that doesn't mean I must lie to them to get the business. I don't do that. You know? And they would ask me questions that I think I cannot do. I'll tell them honestly, this we don't do. But if you want, we can recommend somebody. Or, you know. But some people, they are so hard up for business, they will promise anything. Yeah, 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 this one we do. It's actually over-promising and under-delivering is part of lying. Huh? In business, you over-promise your client, you cannot deliver, and you don't have the capability to deliver. It's called lying in Buddhism because you're not saying the truth. So, again, how you look at it from a perspective, I, as a Buddhist, I don't believe a good salesman should be lying. But there are times that your product really sucks. <laughs> and you know the company also sucks. <laughs> and you, ah, you, know, you better get out of that company. Like, you know. Continue to work there for that few thousand ringgit or whatever salary that you get. It's not worth it. You move on and find a better company. Go to a company that adds values to your life. Don't go to a company that makes you a worse person after that. I think that's an important principle for us to, to, to hold on to. Any other questions? people to your home. I mean, I, I've personally even seen um, a temple the, engaging them. Okay. First thing first, precepts is precepts. Uh, getting a pest control to come to the temple and spray and do whatever it is, does it mean uh, because this is full with good monks and good devotees that that is excusable? The answer is no. In Buddhism, whether you're Buddhist or not Buddhist, what level you call a precept is a precept. Killing is killing. So there's no excuse about that. Now to the question, uh, whether you should be involved in pest control business or what? I think uh, th this, these are very real questions. I think the issue here is, uh, back to your thoughts, There are many different treatments to things. Uh, some pest control can basically, basically get rid. Some pest control do uh, damage control. And that means if the place is infected by termites, of course, some element of killing would have happened. I, I'll be very honest with you. And are those killing very serious killing? Yes and no. Depend again on your thoughts and the method used. Uh, but a lot of time when you get pets control to come in is to also do damage control. And damage control which means they will put certain things there to basically show it. And normally they will go to the neighbor. La. <laughs> Unfortunately, they will find another place. La. If so, you, uh, so they will go to the neighbor. So you know, you're just trying to avoid it and then you will push to the neighbor. La. You're basically passing the problem to the neighbor. La. <laughs> uh, so, these are very tricky questions. So the question is, should we engage? But if the termites is eating the roof and it's going to collapse the whole building, you have no choice. You just have to basically call the pest control to do the damage control and to also solve the problem. You may even have to refix some of the wood, which mostly are woods, huh? woods uh, with a new piece of wood or whatever it is. And now, does that constitute killing? Yes. So, whether a temple should call a pest control or not, I think it's a, it's a decision they have to make. But if there is a killing involved, it is still killing. That's all I can say. You know? So, uh, best, of course, to keep your house as clean as possible, the temple, the center as clean as possible. And all this has to do with habits. Now, for example, my house, we try to keep as clean as possible, but occasionally there are still rats that came. So what do we do? I set up rat traps. So
So I caught the rats. Now the issue now is after catching the rat, what you're going to do? For me, as a Buddhist, I'll take them to the forest nearby or woods nearby. I just let them go. But before I let them go, I talk to them. Yeah? I'm, no, I'm not going to kill you and giving you this life. Please enjoy the life, but do not disturb others. Do not come back and disturb me. And I let it go. Uh, but sometimes you can't avoid it. Even you try to keep it clean. Maybe neighbor house are not clean. So they will, they will have insects and other, all these pets, uh, I mean, all these uh, not so good pets that's going to be around you. You just have to manage it as much as possible in a Buddhistic way. For me, I catch them, I let them go. I know some Chinese will catch a rat and then pour hot water and do all that. I don't do those things. I just let them go and I speak to them. So again, you can try your very best to do uh, the best way to mitigate the situation. If you can't avoid killing has to be involved, then you may have to, you know, basically absorb the, the effect of that killing itself. But those killing, again, if you do study the Buddha's uh, teaching, killing has different levels. Killing an ant is different from killing a man. Killing a man is different from killing a very virtuous man. Again, the levels are very different, depending on the wholesomeness of the person, the life, how long can he, if the life of that being can live very long time, you kill it, you deprive the 20, 50 years he can live, that's more serious than killing an insect which is, can have two weeks of life to, to live. Again, it depends on, in Buddhism, if you study carefully, even killing has different level. So, maybe you may have to call a pest control to come and clean BGF because there are some termites somewhere, there are a lot of woods here. <laughs> and uh, because of that, some elements are killing, but that's to create a better environment for more people to come and practice. There will be good and bad karma along the way. But those karma will be very small comparatively with all the good things that you're doing for BGF, for example. And so it's a tricky question here, very tricky, but we have to handle it with care. But there's no escape. Yeah? There's no escape. Yes, any other questions? So uh, regarding light livelihood, uh, is uh, trading in meat is wrong livelihood. So uh, temples should not sell meat products also, right? Like the fundraisings, we should all only sell vegetarian stuffs. You should pose this question to Dato Suri. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I would I'll entertain that question. So what's the question here? So, uh, so all temples, Buddhist temples, we should be mindful not to sell any meat products in our uh, fundraisings as well, right? Okay, I want to be fair in the answers. Huh? Mm. To be fair, uh, number one, I, want, I need to say that it's not a compulsory for Buddhists to be vegetarian. Mm. The Buddha himself was not a vegetarian. Why? Because when he became a Buddha, Every day he went on an arms round bowl as he was walking with all his monks. People in India was very pious. In general, they are very pious people. They see a holy man come, doesn't matter what religion or what, they will give because they believe, again, simple belief that if they give, there will be good return in terms of spiritual return for them. And they believe in that. So they will give. So when the Buddha was going on Ram's round, obviously every now and then there will be people who cook whatever food lah, and they will offer to the Buddha, the Buddha will take it. The Buddha says, oh, this one, meat. sorry, I don't take meat. Uh, this one, pork, oh, yo, I don't take pork also. The Buddha did not do that because the Buddha knew people offer with the intention of kindness and he received with kindness and he acknowledged with kindness. He eat with kindness. So, in the Buddha's life also, he has also uh, taken meat. And in fact, the last meal offered to the Buddha, remember that the story? Uh, offered that it was supposed to be a poisonous meal. Uh, that, that it was contaminated and things like that. It was not a vegetarian meal. So, it was very obvious in the Buddha's lifetime, 
he did not advocate vegetarianism. And there was one time Devadatta was challenging the Buddha. You know, Devadatta with his, his rebels was challenging the Buddha. I want you, you know, to make these rules for the monk. Number one, monks should all stay in the forest. The Buddha said no. Monks should all be vegetarian and not eat meat. The Buddha says no. So there were many evidence to show the Buddha did not advocate vegetarianism. Why? For that practical reasons and many other because people give out kindness, you just take it. You, know, you cannot be choosy over what food you take. Now, how did the vegetarianism become a very important thing, especially in ancient Chinese culture? Because when Buddhism went over to China during the Han and all those dynasty, Buddhism flourished in China. So much so that many people take up the rope, become monks. Monasteries was built one after another in China in the good old days. And unfortunately, Chinese people are not like Indians. Indians see any holy man, they will give something. Chinese won't do that. In Chinese society during the good old days, they work very hard. The farmers will farm, the traders will trade. People work hard for the money. And they look at the monks are useless people to the society, not contributing anything. So the, when the monks began to become more in China, they cannot go around arms around like India, their Indian counterpart in, in India. Nobody will put any food into their, their bowl. So they face a problem of survival. Survival. What food to eat? Where to get food? All right? Uh, that's why the Chinese have that saying, Zhen Duo Zhou Shao. There's a lot of monks who are not enough forage to go about. Because that's the problem. And monks cannot raise chicken in a monastery and at the right time, oh, Tai Kui, cut at the chicken and make some nice chicken, whatever dish. They can't do that. The only thing they can do is they plant vegetables, beans in a temple monastery compound and they make their own version of food to survive. They can't get from outside like India, they have to survive. So they cook their own. So most of the Chinese monks and nuns are well trained in, in the kitchen matters. Yeah, they, can, they can do and they can cook. Yeah. In fact, a lot of the uh, Mahayana nuns, they are very good chef and cook. They know how to make of the, You ask the Theravada monk now, then can cook, I think. You know. So it's a different environment. So, when they went over to China, they had that problem. And the monks depend on themselves to survive food. And most of the monasteries in, in, in China, were, they are always closed every day because they are practicing. Yeah? They either pee kwan or they have their siu sing inside there. They don't allow outsiders to simply go in. Only time they open the door of the temple to the commoners are uh, the new moon and full moon. Choi yi chap go. The temple doors are open for people to go and do whatever religious things. And when the commoners come into the monastery during the first day of the month or the 15 days of the month, they have interaction with the monks. The monks would welcome them and in hospi good hospitality by providing food to eat. So, what food? Vegetarian food. So, the Chinese in China for many centuries have learned to take vegetarian food, especially from the first day or 15 days of Chinese calendar. So when Buddhism was spread to this part of the world, this part of the world, our forefather came. We, the forefather teach us, And how did it come out? Because it's historical. Never in any part of Buddhism the Buddha advocate vegetarianism. Anyway, the Buddha will emphasize more what is coming out of the mouth than going inside your mouth. Because this, this is dangerous. That has to be sealed. Not so much the eating part, but it's a lot more what comes out of it. And it doesn't mean you are vegetarian, you are morally strong. 
There are many more. There are many vegetarian, famous vegetarian like Hitler, who kills millions of people. Hitler is a vegetarian. He kills millions of people. So, let's get this clear to be fair. Buddhism never, even the Buddha never openly advocates vegetarian. But why became vegetarian became a practice, especially in northern schools of Buddhism, is because of those development. We have to understand that. Yeah? But of course, today we are encouraging people to do more vegetarianism because meat itself also has its not so good things,、uh, especially for farm meat. Uh, there's a lot of chemicals and whatever drugs and antibiotics being used to rear those chickens and whatever other uh, uh, those uh, domestic dom domestic、uh, animals, and because of that, it affects our health. So people are more conscious about health, and therefore they advocate a lot more about vegetarianism. And also, vegetarianism become a, a trend today because.、Uh, People wants to be more kind to other beings, especially the younger generations. You know, so that's where the movement of not eating shark fin, not eating this, not eating that, you know, all becomes a movement today because of that. Yeah, but never, you know, but in Buddhism that says you must be a vegetarian. But if you can practice vegetarian, all, if all in all, you should do that. Because. Vegetarian. If you practice it because of compassion, that's fine. But we cannot force people to be a vegetarian. Just like Devadatta asked the Buddha to say, a room for all monks to be vegetarian. The Buddha says, no. All right. So、uh, practice of vegetarian will it help in the cultivation of compassion? Yes, if you are mindful about that. If your reason of why you want to become vegetarian is because you want to be more Kind to other beings, you want to minimize that. That's fine, but you can't say people who doesn't eat or who doesn't take vegetarian, they are not good Buddhist. And that should not be our judgment. Otherwise, we become very judgmental over people. Yeah, so be careful about that.、Yeah? A person who is not a vegetarian doesn't mean he's a bad person. A person who faithfully follow vegetarian doesn't mean he's a good practicing person. It all go back to his thoughts, speech, and action. So I'm not sure I answered that question, but sorry, it's more selling. We temples shouldn't sell meats on its products. Again, there's no such thing as should or should not. It becomes a rule.、Uh, because a wrong livelihood is part part of wrong livelihood is trading in meat. Sorry, wrong livelihood got includes trading in meat. Now, if your practice has come to that level, let it be so.、Uh, so, but then again, we cannot impose on anybody. That's a, but it is always good for temple、uh, as a show of whatever like this, all for show lah. As a show for solidarity and whatever other reasons that you, on big occasions, you just provide non-vegetarian, I mean non-meat food.、Uh, but. Be careful so that we don't send the wrong message to people. Also at the same time, and be careful also that we do not belittle people who doesn't take full vegetarian meal, because that doesn't mean they are not good practicing Buddhists. So now, as to temple, whether they should or should not, is a policy of the temple, policy of the Buddhist center for them to make that decision. I cannot make. That's why I say you better talk to Dr. Sri about this. Yeah.、Uh, but if you ask me honestly. Uh, it's good to have vegetarian meals served during big occasions like Wednesday,、uh, Sunday, <clears throat> to encourage people to have more veggie meals. You can always say that you know you you will stop killing, but actually the Buddha also have answered that question. Even if you were to stop eating meat, doesn't mean killing will not happen in 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 life. The Buddha have explained that.、Uh, even if all of you were to take vegetarian, it doesn't mean killing will not happen outside also. Because there will still be a lot of people who are ignorant, and they will do those things.、Yeah. And if you go on assumption, the world will be a better place if everybody is a vegetarian. That won't happen. Also, that statement is not correct because it won't happen. It's just like if everybody in this world become grab drivers, there will be no passengers. <laughs> it will never happen. 
You want to be a grab driver? <laughs> so, so all these are assumptions that we make. If everybody becomes vegetarian, then the world will become a better place. Yes, it sounds very ideal, but it will never happen in real life. Just like if everybody becomes a grab driver, then there's no passenger. Cannot be. Right? You know. So the Buddha has explained all this uh, in terms of eating meat uh, issues. Uh, <clears throat> but I think it goes back to intention. What is your intention of eating meat? Um, in some circumstances, we may even have to eat meat for health reasons. But does that mean you know, we, we, we can escape from the act of killing? May not. You may need that meat, but it's necessary for your health reason. Because certain meat has certain whatever, lah, you know. And you need that, and for that reason, you may have to do that. But you prepare for the consequence of breaking that precepts. Back to the temple, I can't say for BGF, so I'm not going to make any comment. Please have a good discussion with Dato Sri and the team. And, but personally, you ask me, is it good to serve vegetarian during most of the Buddhist functions? I think it is. At least we have meatless diet, uh, encourage more eating of fresh vegetables, fresh food, you know, and minus the meat if you can. Yeah. So I think more importantly is in our own practice, can you have a lesser meat diet? For health reason, for religious reason, for whatever reasons. You know. Temple, please have good discussion. Eh? Yeah. But I'm just giving you a perspective. In the Buddha's time, it was never advocated that you should be a vegetarian. Yeah. 